committee's call to order. I want to thank the panelists and our guests for their patience. I think that right now uh, the let's see, did we finish with that side? Uh, he's just finished with his. Oh, okay, side. yes. Now we will recognize Miss Sutton for. Caster. Caster. Who? Miss, I'm sorry. Miss Caster. All right. Well, Miss Caster of Florida, generally from Florida, we recognize for five minutes of questioning to the panel. Okay, thank you. Thank you to the panel very much for, for attending today. Um, the evidentiary standard obviously is very problematic, but I'd like to, you, you've made your points very well on that. I'd like to move on and have a better understanding of the, uh, uh, the statute, how it forbids EPA from sharing information that it obtains, uh, the sharing of scientific data that it obtains with the public. Could you all comment on that, please? Well, I'll take the first shot at it. Um, when a new chemical is introduced, uh, the industry has to submit what's required a pre-manufacture notice. And as, as part of that, there's, there's actually a box on the form that you check that, that claims competition, uh, competitive business information. And it's, uh, we've been told often that that's the default. And we think there, there, if there was more guidance or definition as to when that claim could legitimately be made or if there were a cer certification that the industry would make to to uh, certify the fact that it is indeed CBI would be better than the way it works now. Uh, that's I, I think I, I that's the key part of the problem. But there's also it's it's made worse because unlike most of the other environmental statutes, TSCA doesn't allow EPA to share confidential business information with either states or with other national governments. Um, in most of the statutes, it says if the state or the other national government can provide equivalent protection for that trade secret information, then you can share it with them. TSCA doesn't have any provision like that. It has a flat prohibition on sharing any confidential business information. So the, that combined with the ease with which you can classify something as confidential, uh, that's, that's what contributes to the problem. Yes. If I can add kind of another model, um, the OSHA hazard communication standard um, also has a provision for trade secrecy, but, but it has two, um, two important provisions. One is that, that if um, the the chemical in question, the chemical mixture usually, is, is obtainable on the open market and can be, re, can be essentially, re, um, it's called reverse engineered, analyzed in a lab to figure out what it is, then it's really not much of a trade secret um, because any competitor could do that. So uh, the standard excludes things that can be reverse engineered. Um, and second, it provides a provision that people um, with a legitimate need to know that information um, for example, in our case, a worker representative, a worker himself or herself, um, somebody providing medical treatment can also get um, what would otherwise be confidential business information. And those would be good things to include. Yeah, I think it's fairly obvious that we can modernize the statute to better serve the public, and uh, especially when it comes to, to uh, information that families uh, need to need to understand is is it true that that since Tosca was adopted in 1976 that uh, it has only led to one group of chemicals that have been subjected to a ban because of its of its properties um, the, the example we use there's only been five in total um, and I don't know what chemical classes those were in, but uh, even of those, uh, the corrosion fitting case that dealt with asbestos, the courts threw that out because it couldn't meet the high evidentiary standard within the law. Uh, it, of course, didn't address whether the asbestos was safe or not, uh, like courts often do. They just uh, showed that it uh, didn't meet the standards in Tosca. 
In, in Mr. Stevenson, in your uh, written testimony, you gave an, an example of formaldehyde, and I think it would be uh, very helpful to, to take just a minute and explain that circumstance of the, the uh, formaldehyde and wood coming from China that now cannot go to other countries but is, uh, continues to be marketed in the United States. Well, uh, um, you're getting even beyond Tosca into uh, uh, assessing the toxicity of their chemicals as well, and there's many ways you can do that. It doesn't all fall under Tosca. Um, that process is also broken at EPA, uh, the Integrated Risk Information System process. And uh, formaldehyde is, is a case where um, the, the research is compelling but not compelling enough for EPA to regulate. So that's sort of related but a little bit different issue. But in my time is running out, I'd, it, I'd recommend that you all review this, this case of the wood now that, that other countries are able to, to right. regulate and keep out of their countries because of the toxic chemicals uh, contained therein, but it's still coming to the United States, including some of the trailers that uh, were provided to Katrina. Absolutely. That's true of asbestos, too. Every other, nearly every other country in the world has banned it. We have not. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Seeing no, that there are no more members, I want just to thank uh, this panel. Uh, this will conclude your testimony. And I want you to uh, be, uh, to understand that all witnesses should be prepared to respond to written follow-up questions submitted by members of the subcommittee. Uh, again, I want to thank you so much for your patience and you uh, really helped us along. You provided a, a real service to the American people by your presence here today. Thank you, and may God bless you in your travels. Thank you. As uh, this panel, the first panel departs, I would ask that the second panel be prepared now to come and join us at the witness table. The second panel, uh, that they will be testifying on the oath, and as a result of that, would you please rise and uh, to be sworn in. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Please let the record reflect that all witnesses have responded in the affirmative. Please take your seat. I want to introduce the witnesses beginning at my left, your right. Mr. Richard Dennison is the senior scientist for the Environmental Defense Fund. Mr. Kate, Ms. Katie Gerwig is the Vice President of Workplace Safety and Environmental. Uh, she's the stewardship officer at Kaiser Permanente, uh, ex-member of the House is with us here, Mr. Carol Dooley, who I served as the co-chairman on the Bio Committee, the Bio Task Force. Mr. Dooley is now the president and CEO of the American Chemistry Council. He served in the House from 91 to 2005, representing both the 17th and 20th districts of California. Uh, not consecutively, you know, he didn't represent them all at the same time. Now. Uh, Mr. V.M. Jim DeLisi is the president of Fanwell Chemical Incorporated. He's the chairman of the International Affairs Committee, the Synthetic Organic Chemical Manufacturers Association. <clears throat> Mr. Charles T. Drevna is the president of the National Petrochemical and Refiners Association. I would ask that the panelists now 
uh, provide a minimum of five minutes of opening statements, or maximum of five minutes of opening statements, beginning with Mr. Dennis. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman Rush and Ranking Member Radonovich for um, holding this hearing today. I'd like to do three brief things in my testimony today. I want to start with a story about one chemical. In fact, it's the chemical that Congresswoman Castro was just speaking about that illustrates why reform of Tosca is so urgent. I then want to briefly describe several structural problems with Tosca that help to explain why EPA has been unable to act effectively to ensure chemical safety. And finally, I want to describe how U.S. policies are falling behind those of the rest of the world, putting U.S. companies at risk of losing access to global markets and putting all of us at risk of becoming a dumping ground for unsafe products made elsewhere in the world. That brings me to the story about that one chemical. The U.S. imports vast amounts of plywood from China that is made using formaldehyde-based adhesives, a chemical known to cause cancer, to exacerbate asthma, and to cause numerous other respiratory ailments. Some of that plywood ended up in the infamous FEMA trailers, to which so many people were forced to flee in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. That toxic exposure turned what was already a national scandal into a true debacle. The plywood China sells to the United States cannot legally be sold to Japan or the European Union, nor can it be sold even for domestic use in China. And that is because all of those countries have enacted strong regulations that restrict the release of, of formaldehyde. As of January of this year, California also enacted such regulations. Now, China exports a low formaldehyde version of this plywood to Japan and the European Union, but it continues to enjoy a market for its more toxic product here in the United States. Domestic makers of low or even formaldehyde-free plywood can't compete with those cheap imports from China. So we are hurting American businesses that have found safer alternatives to this use. Last year, EPA was petitioned by 5,000 citizens to take the California regulations and adopt them nationally. EPA promptly denied that petition. It said that the information available on formaldehyde, one of the best studied chemicals in all of commerce, was insufficient. As bad as that sounds, what's worse is that EPA is likely right. EPA must show that a chemical presents an unreasonable risk as defined under TSCA and interpreted by the courts. And I think many other witnesses have already alluded to the fact that that burden is so high that it essentially is impossible to meet. Over the history of TSCA, EPA has banned only one group of chemicals, PCBs. And that was because Congress legislated the ban. It has partially restricted four other sets of chemicals in, an, in the 33-year history. In the 1980s, EPA tried to ban asbestos, as we've heard. Um, and it was immediately challenged by industry, and the courts overturned that decision. I just want to, a lot has been said about that already, but I want to add two other things. First. EPA took over 10 years to develop that regulation, and they amassed a 45,000-page documentary record of the risks of, of asbestos. Despite that, the courts found EPA had not met its burden under TSCA. Now, it's become fashionable in some circles to argue that the problem with TSCA is that EPA hasn't been trying hard enough or hasn't been doing a good enough job. I ask you, if 45,000 pages of documentation and 10 years of regulatory development is not enough to ban a chemical like asbestos, what is? Something is badly broken. Tosca has never been significantly amended in the 33 life it's lived. Um, despite enormous changes in our chemicals economy and our state of knowledge about chemicals, one example, we now know that all Americans, including newborn infants, carry hundreds of synthetic chemicals in their bodies. 
some at levels that we already know are high enough to cause harm in laboratory animals. The more chemicals we look for in people, the more we find. And yet, government nor industry can tell us how those chemicals got there, nor can they adequately explain what their impact will be on our health. TSCA fails to provide EPA with the authority it needs to develop information to identify not only unsafe chemicals, but safe chemicals that could be substitutes for the risky ones. And TSCA forbids EPA from sharing that information, even with other levels of government, as we've already heard. Companies are largely free to claim the uh, information that they deem confidential. Those claims are rarely, if ever, reviewed or even required to be justified up front. And even the name of, and the identity of a chemical that is being submitted because of a study that shows high risk, the identity of that chemical can be hidden from the public. EPA has had to, vo had to resort to voluntary programs given these constraints that it has to operate under. The most notable of these is the High Production Volume Challenge Program. Now, we supported that when it was launched a decade ago. Could you please bring your uh, testimony to a close? You know, only the five minutes. Please bring it to a close. But, but that program, I will wrap up very quickly here. That program has failed to deliver the data because it is a voluntary program. Um, I want to just end by saying that lest you think that what we are looking for with TSCA reform is a heavier hand of government, the largest failing of TSCA is, its di is the dysfunctional market it perpetuates, one that is ill-informed and does not allow anyone who, ne who needs to make good decisions about chemicals access to the information to make those good decisions. Thank you, Thank you, very, you very much. much. Uh, Ms. Gerwig, please, five minutes. Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you very much for inviting me to testify today. I'm Kathy Gerwig. I am Vice President and Environmental Stewardship Officer for Kaiser Permanente. That's the nation's largest integrated health care delivery system. We provide comprehensive health services to 8.7 million people in nine states and the District of Columbia. At Kaiser Permanente, we recognize that a healthy environment is critical to the health and wellness of every person. We are dedicated to environmental sustainability as we believe it has direct positive effects on individual and community health. We lead and support innovative efforts to decrease pollu pollutants and enhance the environment. This year, we'll spend about $13 billion on purchased products and services. We lease or own more than 65 million square feet of real estate. We have a 10-year capital plan of more than $30 billion. Despite this leverage, we have experienced limitations in achieving our goal of using products and materials that are environmentally sustainable. We have developed our own chemicals disclosure document that is required for all of our large purchasing contracts. This disclosure asks suppliers for information on the categories of persistent bioaccumulative toxic compounds, carcinogens, mutagens, reproductive toxins, and specific chemicals of concern, such as mercury, polyvinyl chloride, phthalates, bisphenol A, and halogenated flame retardants. When the information is provided by suppliers, there are many times that it's not meaningful due to the vendor's lack of knowledge, trade secret caveats, or the absence of safety information for thousands of chemicals in commerce today. We are also challenged by suppliers' claims that a product is green when it doesn't meet our environmental criteria. For example, a product that saves energy, which is good, might be made of vinyl, which creates dioxin pollution. Starting in 1997, Kaiser Permanente spent 10 years virtually eliminating mercury, a neurotoxin, from our operations. We now use digital thermometers and blood pressure devices. The mercury in esophageal dilators was replaced with tungsten by that industry. Now there's emerging evidence that tungsten is related to leukemia in towns near tungsten mining operations. This is an example of a large effort across the healthcare sector to replace a known hazardous material, which may be resulting in the unintentional use of potentially hazardous material. Another example includes the replacement of products containing di-2-ethylhexyl phthalate, or DEHP, which is used as a plasticizer in flexible medical devices, such as intravenous tubing and bags. 
DEHP can leach from the plastic, posing health risks. Our project began in 2001 when evidence was available to show that DEHP is a potential reproductive toxicant to neonatal males. We identified alternatives, conducted clinical trials before we were able to begin using products free of DEHP. For more than 10 years, Kaiser Permanente has been working to reduce our use of vinyl products because vinyl creates dioxin pollution when it is manufactured or incinerated. In 2004, we were instrumental in driving the creation of a vinyl-free carpet suitable for healthcare settings. It was a multi-year effort that took considerable time and resources on our part. We now contract exclusively with the vendor that created that product, and we have installed approximately 10 million square feet of this carpet in our facilities. When we were testing alternatives to hard surface flooring made from vinyl, we had to actually invent our own testing protocol and use in-house certified industrial hygienists to perform tests to understand the health impacts of the alternatives. As we strive to use products that are not harmful, we invest significant time and resources. That degree of investment is simply not feasible for most products and materials we buy. Nor is it possible for smaller organizations that don't have the resources and skills that Kaiser Permanente has developed over the decades. Mechanisms are needed to support downstream users, such as us, in procuring safer products and materials for our needs. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity, and I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you, Ms. Gerwig. Mr. Dooley? Thank you, uh, members of the subcommittee. My name is Cal Dooley, and I'm president and CEO of the American Chemistry Council. And our council represents about 140 member companies that produce almost 85 percent of the chemicals manufactured in this country. You know, I'd just ask you to briefly consider the role the chemicals played in your lives today. Chemical products are fundamental to the clothes you wear, the way you go, got to work this morning, the electronic products that you communicate with, the chair you're seating on, the protective finish on the dais and the desk. Chemicals are the medicines that help save lives, the safety equipments that protect our children and our military forces, and the insulation and the lightweight vehicles that reduce greenhouse gas emissions and save energy. ACC and its members share your goal of protecting human health and the environment from risks associated with some chemicals. In the vast majority of cases, however, chemicals can be and are used safely. While ACC believes that Tosca has been protective of health and the environment, there are good reasons why Congress should consider modernizing this statute. First, it is clear that the public, for a variety of reasons, does not have confidence that the regulatory system is adequately ensuring the safety of the products they use. Second, Science and technology of testing and detecting chemicals has advanced considerably since Tosca was enacted, and we can more effectively incorporate these new capabilities into a modernized regulatory system. And third, modernizing Tosca will make the best use of emerging developments in science and technology and protect our nation's interests in an innovative, competitive chemical industry. My simple message to the subcommittee this morning is that ACC and its members' companies are prepared to work with you in modernizing Tosca. I'd like to quickly address a few of the areas where Congress should focus its attention in considering changes to Tosca. We are committed to having the appropriate hazard use and exposure information necessary to make decisions about safe use, and we think the approach should be reflected in law. In general, we think it is appropriate to have more information about those uses where there are or may be exposures to humans or the environment. Information requirements should be driven by use and exposure patterns. We support new detection methodologies uh, like biomonitoring. We think the federal chemical management system should be robust enough to apply that data and other relevant information in a prioritization process that allows a focus on key health and safety concerns like potential exposures to children. EPA should use hazard use and exposure information to determine the safety of priority chemicals for their intended uses. Safety assessments conducted by EPA should not simply rely, however, on hazard as a sole determinant of the outcome. As an example, consider a sim single chemical that might be used in many different applications, maybe from bullet-resistant vests, 
and goods that are used in the retail marketplace to a chemical input in an industrial process. While the hazard characteristics are clearly the same, regardless of the application, the exposure and risk considerations will vary significantly. This simple example helps illustrate the questions that a federal chemical management system must be capable of addressing. For example, what additional information is needed to assure that the chemical can be used safely for its intended purpose? On what basis should EPA make a decision that it is safe? How should EPA well weigh the relative hazards and risks of the alternatives? And how can we assure that the decisions are made in a timely manner and that they protect health and the environment and the natural in national interest and in technological innovation? In ACC's view, a robust federal chemical management system must be capable of providing chemical manufacturers, users, the public, and the government with the answers to those questions. Those are the questions that we're committed to addressing, and we're also committed to addressing to working with you toward the goal of modernizing TSCA. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dooley. Uh, Mr. DeLisi. Uh, good evening, or good, rather good afternoon. It's a pleasure uh, being before this distinguished subcommittee. My name is Jim DeLisi, and I am president of Fanwood Chemical located in Fanwood, New Jersey. Sir, could you uh, speak into the microphone? Thank you. Um, I'm president of Fanwood Chemical, located in Fanwood, New Jersey. Fanwood Chemical is a member of SOCMA, the leading trade association representing the batch and custom chemical industry. Our industry makes a $60 billion annual contribution to the U.S. economy and contributes to the chemical industry's position as the nation's leading exporter. SOCMA supports EPA and Congress's fundamental goal of protecting health and the environment. SOCMA members are prepared to do our part in that effort. We are pleased to have this opportunity to share with you our perspective on revisiting the Toxic Substances Control Act. As I will explain today, SOCMA agrees with many that TSCA needs to be revisited and certain aspects of EPA's TSCA program could be improved. But a sweeping overhaul like implementing Europe's REACH is unnecessary and would be unwise. Since its enactment, TSCA and its unreasonable risk standard have generally stood the test of time as a flexible law that has protected human health and the environment without crippling innovation. First, I would like to start by saying that any evaluation of TSCA should consider the contributions the chemical industry has made in providing the United States with one of the highest standards of living in the world, even as overall indices of public health and environmental quality have improved. Secondly, any evaluation should also take into account the vast amount of data that have been submitted by our industry to the EPA and to other agencies such as the FDA, DOT, OSHA, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, under other statutes that regulate our industry. Lastly, it should look at how this balance between protecting human health and the environment and preserving innovation has been achieved and how it can be maintained. SOCMA believes this balance has been and will continue to be achieved by a chemicals policy that is fundamentally guided by science and a careful assessment of risk. Data requirements have been driven by the intended and foreseeable use and disposal of a chemical. This fundamental approach should be maintained when considering a revised approach to chemical risk management. One area of TSCA that has faced substantial criticism in the reporting requirements applicable to industry. In particular, many believe that EPA does not have sufficient authority under TSCA to request data. SOCMA disagrees with this claim, but we do believe that data gathering is an area worthy of improvement and that we should reconsider what is the best approach to gathering data and information on chemicals. In order to do this, Congress should look at how EPA currently implements TSCA and consider how the program could be enhanced. Before amending TSCA to create new obligations for EPA, Congress should also explore whether EPA can better leverage activities going on outside of the TSCA program, whether occurring under federal agencies like FDA or abroad. For example, companies are embarking on a massive project to generate standardized test data for European REACH program. Through collaborative data sharing efforts, EPA should be able to take advantage of the work done for that program, just as other pro countries can leverage the work conducted here. Why should the United States want to duplicate testing that is already being conducted? A collaborative approach should be promoted by Congress. This leads me to the Chemical Assessment and Management Program, better known as CHAMP. 
the voluntary program to which the United States committed in 2007, along with Canada and Mexico, under the Security and Prosperity Partnership. Through this program, EPA is prioritizing chemicals by hazard and risk in order to systematically decide what further action may or may not be required. EPA is already well down the path of implementing this program. CHAMP is also addressing the TOSCA inventory. EPA has initiated action to reset the TOSCA inventory to more accurately identify chemicals in commerce. Many people do not realize that at any given time, significantly fewer than the roughly 80,000 chemicals currently on the inventory are likely to actually be in commerce. For example, the last inventory update rule reported only 6,200 chemicals in commerce during 2005. Admittedly, that does not include materials produced on a single site at less than 25,000 pounds a year. Nevertheless, this important fact is conveniently ignored by those who try to show that TOSCA is inadequate, who claim that the inventory reflects the number of chemicals in com commerce, and then compare that number to the number of existing chemicals that have been studied by EPA under Section 4. In closing, Sakma has pointed out several main areas of TOSCA that are being enhanced, and we would urge you to focus your current inquiry on how to better implement existing authorities and activities. Sakma believes that TOSCA will not require a complete overall, but could be enhanced by new challenges. Thank you, and I look forward to taking questions. Zemina? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Rush, uh, Ranking Member Radonovich, and uh, Sub, the rest of the subcommittee, thanks, thanks for having us here. My name is Charlie Drevna. I am president of, the, of NPRA, the National Petrochemical and Refiners Association. Our member companies produce the basic chemicals that are the building blocks of the thousands of finished products that help make our lives simpler and safer. NPRA welcomes the opportunity to provide its perspective uh, on the Toxic Substances Control Act, which is one of the key laws that can, that can directly affect the marketplace, both, both for chemicals and for finished products. Congress enacted TOSCA in 1976 as an effort to categorize and evaluate the risk of chemicals that the risk of chemicals may pose to, to um, humans and the environment. NPRA believes that the intent of Congress in crafting uh, the statute was to construct a scientifically based chemical risk management program that was protective of, the, of human health and the environment, while also allowing the development of products that will enhance health, safety, and this environment. NPRA fully understands the committee's desire to examine TOSCA's implementation and, where necessary, make the appropriate modifications to the statute uh, to ensure that its goals and objectives are realized. We live in an era where global competition and rapid technologic change, now unfortunately coupled with a debilitating financial crisis, are calling into question the business and political foundations upon which our prosperity has rested for decades. NPRA believes we must <clears throat> ensure the overarching goals of TOSCA are achieved while at the same time promoting an innovation in creating life-saving uh, or enhancing products, promoting economic growth, and strengthening American competitive competitiveness in the global marketplace. We are confident that these goals are complementary, not mutually exclusive, as some would say. And NPRA pledges to work with Congress and with all stakeholders to ensure the desired outcome. Recently, several groups have called for a substantial overhaul of TOSCA uh, to make it more like the system recently adopted in Europe, otherwise known as REACH. While I agree that we could all benefit by first reviewing and then perhaps reforming uh, uh, TOSCA and updating certain sections, I do not believe that a wholesale rewrite is necessary, especially given the fact that systems like REACH are largely new and untested. We have not yet begun to see what the impact of REACH will have on chemicals management in the EU or its effect on a European economy. My written testimony further elaborates on this point. NPR, NPRA believes that a more pragmatic approach to TOSCA reform will result in better chemicals management system and still achieve the original intent of Congress. Key, er key areas to explore while examining TOSCA uh, reform include information sharing, information collection and use, and a statutory re uh, recognition of EPA's own best, best practices and timelines for action. For example, EPA could share confidential business information with other types uh, uh, of government officials, both domestic and foreign 
as long as that information is afforded the same level of protection required of EPA. NPRA would not object to changes in the statute that would allow uh, for better information sharing. Another area that could be updated is how EPA collects information and, and prioritizes future work. Under TSCA, EPA is given the authority to collect information on the hazards, potential exposures, and risks of chemicals. However, the statute does not mandate that the information be collected in any particular order, nor does it require EPA to collect and disseminate the information in a timely manner. In addition, test rules could be updated to reflect EPA's own, own best practices and specific timelines for action. Test rules could also institutionalize a tiered, targeted, and risk-based risk based approach, which has proven over time to be the most effective and efficient chemical, chemicals policy. NPRA urges this subcommittee to consider the approaches used by Canada and the United States under the Security and Prosperity Management Program, otherwise known as CHAMP, and at, at EPA and is already uh, uh, undertaking and making significant progress. This innovative program <clears throat> should be afforded the opportunity to work and produce the re desired results. The last area I would like to address is EPA resources for TSCA implementation. While, this, while many say the statute is flawed or outdated, I contend that a lack of sufficient funding has been every bit of a bigger problem as any challenge posed by statutory language. EPA must be given the resources to appropriately manage chemicals and commerce. In conclusion, I believe that if we take a careful, thorough look at TSCA and the history of its implementation, along with the funding requirements associated with this kind of complex and technical work, we will find a strong statutory framework. I think if we work together as stakeholders in a transparent process and give this effort the time and thought that it deserves, we will, we will end up in this nation with a chemicals management system that is unparalleled. I thank you for your attention and the opportunity to be here today and look forward to your questions. Chair, uh, thanks to all the witnesses. I recognize myself for five minutes uh, for the purpose of questioning the panel. <clears throat> I would like to ask each one of you on the record the same basic question that I asked the first panel, do you believe that Tosca needs to be reformed? Please answer yes or no, beginning with Mr. Dennison. Yes, I do, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Ms. Gerwin? Mr. Chairman, my organization has not taken a public policy position. All right. Uh, uh, the Honorable uh, Cal Dooley? <clears throat> we support modernization and reform. Yes. Mr. DeLisi? We, we support revisiting the statute. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we support the revisiting, then, if necessary, the reform. I think it has to be a, a, a stepwise process. All right. Uh, Mr. Dennison, it sounds to me like there are a lot of problems with this statute. Looks that way to me. Furthermore, it sounds, sounds to me like there are, that these are generally problems that cannot be fixed by having EPA take a different approach to interpreting or getting a few more staff. Interpreting the statute or getting a few more staff. At the same time, others have suggested that the problem here is not really the statute, that the problem is EPA's interpretation of the statute. Now, what do you believe? Do you believe that the statute really needs to be rewritten, or do you think that changes as the EPA to address all these problems and concerns? Mr. Chairman, I believe that the problems with TSCA are fundamentally structural and inherent to the language um, with the addition that legal interpretation of those standards has made matters even worse and has confounded the congressional intent as evidenced in the original statute. Um, but the problems are structural in that they require such heavy burdens on the agency in terms of both resources and evidence that they effectively take provisions that would work if, the, if those burdens were not so high and make them unworkable. For example, um, the requirement of, of, uh, that EPA must face to require a company to test a chemical is so onerous in terms of having to first have evidence that that chemical may pose a risk 
in order to require information that um, the catch-22 that was alluded to earlier is in operation. Even if that were not there, the fact that a, a rule to require testing has to go through full notice and comment rulemaking and takes many hundreds of thousands of dollars to develop and two to ten years to develop <coughs> means that when we, are, when we are dealing with tens of thousands of chemicals, we simply can't rely on a system that has that level of burden placed on the agency and that level of resource required. <coughs> morning about the difficulties that your company is facing trying to move toward using safer chemicals. And I applaud your company's efforts. Uh, you describe tremendous costs that Kaiser Permanente has taken on, on in this effort, including hiring your own industrial hygienists and coming up with the testing protocols to test the safety of products and chemicals that you use. Uh, this sounds to me like it's a very large burden that you have assumed. Are you aware of any other companies that are doing similar things? Do you think that a smaller company will be able to do what you've done? It is a significant uh, use of our time and resources to do the kind of testing that we've done. and. Um, I think there are other organizations that take on some similar tasks. I don't know of any that actually go to the lengths that we have gone to um, for so long. As I mentioned in my testimony, we've been doing this for more than a decade. And I think smaller organizations would be um, uh, find it to be an extreme burden on their resources to try to do the kind of work that we're doing. So um, it is an investment on our part that we're making in order to achieve the goals that we want to achieve, and it represents uh, an organizational burden of time and resources. Sorry, would you mind repeating that? You're aware of any other companies besides Kaiser, your company? that's doing similar things? I'm not aware of any organization that's doing the amount of testing that we're doing, but I know that there are other organizations and some healthcare organizations that are uh, focusing on single chemicals or single products. The chair now recognizes the ranking member for uh, five minutes of questioning, and then we'll see. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, um, um, I want to welcome the panel and thank you for being here. I just uh, I want to preface the discussion that we have by <clears throat> quoting a, a New York Times article that was printed on June 30th of 2008, and it's it's regarding the hyperbole of of taking on difficult subjects like this. It it starts out by saying, "Need press repeat green, sex, toxic, cancer, secret, and fat." Those are the things that get attention on the press, and I. The reason I'm saying that is because when you start talking about uh, a previous wit witness mentioned the idea of the, the, the shower curtains that were a problem emitting odors, and it was later on debunked um, in total because uh, uh, after they, they went into it and found out that there was nothing behind the, the accusation that it could be releasing as many as 108 volatile chemicals. And, and this is the scary part about getting into something into changes like this, and most people here agree that Tosca needs to be looked at. But what I don't want to see is a repeat of the Consumer Product Safety Act where you end up in, uh, putting an incredible burden on industry, uh, raising their costs in association with this. So, so again, you know, th this is the red flag that needs to go up when the consideration of, of the revision of something like Tosca needs to happen. I, I do have a couple of questions. Uh, Mr. Dennison, when you mentioned on, on the issue of asbestos, uh, I, was it Tosca that prevented asbestos from, as I understand that the, regula the regulations uh, that were being sought after were, had failed in court. Wasn't it shoddy workmanship on, on the a part of EPA that brought that case to the court that ended up uh, uh, preventing the, uh, the, the listing of, of asbestos? 
Uh, Congressman, it, it absolutely was not. Um, EPA spent more than a decade and millions of dollars developing that regulation. It, uh, it amassed, as I said, a 45,000-page record of documentation. What the court found was uh, on several levels that the, the agency um, had not examined every possible alternative to asbestos in every possible use of asbestos on the market. Um, and if you read that court decision and the analyses that have been done of it, you find very quickly that the amount of work that, e that the agency would have had to have done to have met the statutory requirements as interpreted by the courts was simply impossible to reach. Let, let me read the court uh, decision. It says, quote, we note that all the asbestos bans, of all the asbestos bans, the EPA did the most impressive job in this area, both in conducting its studies and in supporting its contention that banning asbestos products would save over 102 lives. Were the petitions only questioning the EPA's decision to ban friction products, like brake pads, we would be tempted to uphold the EPA. <coughs> Well, in that particular case, I, uh, I'm not familiar with that particular passage, but I, I think what they were saying was that the, the standard of evidence that was required under the statute was only met, according to the court, in that one area. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that that's the only area that EPA looked at the risks or looked at the benefits, but that's, the, that's how high the bar was. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Dennison. One of the other questions, you know, I, I want to repeat this throughout this hearing because I think it needs to be a mantra, and as a previous witness had mentioned, uh, the, the awful accident in Bhopal, Indus, uh, India. I failed to see any part of Tosca that had anything to do with that accident or where that law came into it. But you bring up these sexy things that get press and you alarm people and it opens the door to regulations that can be not, not really done surgically to make a law better, but it brings it in with a meat cleaver and makes a mess out of it. So. Uh, that's the caution that I want to make, that is, if we move forward to regulation, that it works for everybody and it keeps uh, a, a, le a legitimate, th good industry and, and, and allows them to, to, to continue to thrive. So with that, Mr. DeLisi, I'd like to ask you uh, one more question. I come from the point of view that managing risk is not as simple as removing risk, but rather gets into the business of risk-risk trade-offs. Could you please tell me if you agree with this risk-risk trade-off concept as it relates to the regulation of chemicals, for example, maybe formaldehyde? Well, absolutely. Um, the, uh, frankly, I, wouldn't, I would not want to be a regulator that had to try to make some of these decisions. Uh, but when you replace a chemical, you need to understand completely what the trade-offs are. And uh, some of the things that have been suggested for replacement, uh, things like benzene, I mean, if you don't have benzene, you don't have Tylenol. So um, there needs to be a careful study uh, of the trade-offs that are being made. Things like tires, we all ex understand uh, the risks. Tires can explode. I was on a New Jersey turnpike yesterday and a truck lost a tire that exploded. We, we face that every day, so we all face risk trade-offs in our lives every day, and it's also involved in the chemical industry, too. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I see that I'm over time, so I would like, would request a, one more round of questioning after. Uh... The, chairman is, uh, the chairman is committed to going into a second round of questions for those members who can't complete their line of questions in the five-minute time. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Mr. Chairman. All right. Uh, the chair now recognizes Ms. Schakowsky of Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And first, let me apologize to the panel for not being in the in the room for your testimony. I think, as Mr. Dooley is well aware, that won't prevent me from asking questions, well even if it should. Um, so, if you don't mind, um, Mr. Dennison, this is uh, directed to uh, to you. Actually, they all are. Um, as we've heard from um, several members today, everybody supports the use of, of good science. So I think it, it is instructive to the uh, committee to be aware of the recent observations of a committee of the National Research Council. In uh, a 2006 report entitled Toxicity Testing for the Assessment of Environmental Agents, the committee stated 
TASCA authorizes EPA to review existing chemicals, but toxicity and exposure information on them is typically so incomplete that it does not support the review process. The basis for establishing priorities and requiring testing for industrial chemicals in the United States has not progressed much over the last 20 years. I'm wondering if you agree with this assessment of these scientific experts. Congresswoman, I do very much. I believe the National Academy was one of the first to sound the alarm about the lack of data way back in the mid-1980s and pointed out that Tosca was failing even then to generate the information needed to base good scientific decisions about chemicals on. And that, that uh, report that you alluded to, to just two years ago uh, simply says that we have not made much progress in the intervening two decades in terms of tackling that basic problem. The Academy has also issued a set of, of reports over the last few months on risk assessment as managed by the, by the Environmental Protection Agency, and it has found that there are major problems with the assumptions that EPA uses and with the lack of ability for EPA to recognize that people are exposed to multiple chemicals at the same time, not just one chemical at a time. So I think the, the good science uh, mantra that we hear here is absolutely a need that requires TOSCA reform because TOSCA is not using the best science. And I think that um, we have an opportunity here to bring our chemicals management program into the 21st century in terms of using the, goods, the best science out there uh, to drive these decisions. So the notion that good science is only practiced by industry somehow or that this is a one-sided issue is not the case. This all may have come up already in testimony. So when we do, uh, were we to do um, in a perfect world the kind of review that is necessary, it wouldn't just be uh, chemical by chemical review, we would also be looking at the cumulative effect and the interactions as well? That's right. We, we are exposed to multiple chemicals from multiple sources all at the same time, and yet our assessment methods and our way of going about getting data on chemicals one at a time does not lend itself to elucidating the question, what is the impact of all of that cumulative and aggregate exposure? So there, there's a lot of new science going on here that could, could begin to answer that question. We need to incorporate that best science into the way EPA assesses chemicals. Um, you know, we, we worked uh, a lot in this uh, subcommittee and committee on the Consumer Product Safety uh, Commission Improvement Act. Um, and I've heard some su suggest that we shouldn't worry about levels of a particular chemical in a particular product, such as phthalates and in, in rubber duckies, because it's uh, far too low to have any impact. Um, how are we to respond to, to, to that kind of uh, charge? Well, <clears throat> it's a very good question. I, I think the, the, the emphasis that um, the associations at this table just made on the need to look at use of chemicals in making decisions about them, I heartily endorse. The problem has been that we have done a very lousy job as a nation in understanding what we can be exposed to and how. Um, the phthalates in plastics, the brominated flame retardants used in our furniture are all chemicals that for decades we were told there would be no human exposure to those chemicals. They absolutely would stay put and we would never be exposed to them. We have found out how wrong those assumptions were. So I think part of the reason why I call for much more comprehensive information about chemicals, including the use of chemicals, because I agree that's very important, is because without that information, we make wrong assumptions that prove wrong only decades later when essentially the entire human population has been exposed to those chemicals and we still don't know what the risks are. Well, this is a new area of jurisdiction for our subcommittee that we look very much forward to, uh, to working on. I thank all of you for your uh, input and testimony. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Thank you all for your testimony. I'm trying to understand um, how uh, Tosca is, is viewed um, from sort of d different quarters. And um, I imagine there's some people who would say that it's, it's a joke. Would, I mean, if you, were, if you were just at lunch with somebody, Mr. Dennison, and they said, oh yeah, Tosca, you know, that regulates chemical safety. Would you say, well, that's really kind of a joke, or would you say it's an open secret that it doesn't really do much, or would you say, well, that's a reasonably good statute that just needs some, some um, upgrading and overhauling? Just kind of put it in the vernacular for me. Um, <clears throat> Congressman, I think I'd probably aim toward the middle of the three statements you made. I think it is largely an open secret that this policy has not been sufficiently protective, that EPA has not been able to get information it needs and has not been able to act on that information when it does happen to obtain it. So it is, uh, I don't know that it's a joke. I think the intent at the time and the policy statements in Tosca are very solid. The problem has been that it simply has not delivered on the promises it made. And, and I think that is uh, inherent in a statute that, that has not been looked at for essentially three decades. So we have to go back and figure out why it didn't work and fix those structural defects. Let me ask you about reach, because a couple people have alluded to that, some with a sense of alarm, and um, I'd ask anyone on the panel to speak to this. Um, is, is reach too far of a, uh, is that overreaching to go to reach? I mean, it, how much of a burden would that really represent? Um, and describe that burden in terms of there might be an initial period of, you know, assimilating the, the new standards, but presumably over time you can make the gathering of information, the presentation of, of safety data and other things part of the, the, the course of your operations that, such that it would not be so burdensome. So, and I don't know that reach is the answer, it's just it's been invoked a couple of times as a standard either to be concerned about or to, or to, or to reach for. So again, anybody can speak yeah, to that? I, I would like to make a, a couple of comments on that. First, um, many of the things that have been discussed this morning and this afternoon uh, are not regulated by TSCA. The, uh, there was a lot of discussion this morning about exposure to uh, biocides and insecticides and things like that, which are regulated under FIFRA, not under TSCA. And my understanding from my friends in the ag chemical industry is there is broad reviews being undertaken on a whole swath of ag chemicals under the FIFRA statute. There was some reference this morning to some cleaning products and some cons consumer goods. I don't think Tosca was ever envisioned to be involved in that. That's the Consumer Product Safety Commission and other places where things are reasonably well regulated. Uh, reach is a significant overreach um, because of the, the, uh, the deadlines and the, the way things are put together under reach in the, the uh, so-called substance information exchange forms. When the EU proposed reach, they expected to have somewhere around 30,000 products and, and 300,000 pre-registrations. What they ended out with is 2.5 million pre-registrations of 150,000 products. Until the world gets a chance to see if REACH can work, it, it, three or four years from now we may all be sitting here saying REACH is an, is an outstandingly good way to regulate chemicals and be recommending it to Congress and EPA to look at it. But I think the EU needs a chance to, to test it and see if it works. There are many of us that believe it's going to have a substantial de detrimental effect on the EU economy all the way up the line. Yes, uh, Congressman Sarbanes. Um, you know, I would uh, just encourage the committee. Uh, uh, Stu Eisenstadt uh, has submitted a statement uh, for the record uh, that deals with REACH, and I'd encourage you to read it. It, it includes some of the information that Mr. DeLisi uh, also addressed. But I'd also encourage the committee to look not only at REACH, but look at the Canadian uh, system that they are currently putting in place, because they are somewhat different, and I think they are instructive in terms of how we think we can be most effective in modernizing our TOSCA system. 
one of our concerns about REACH is, is that it doesn't really embrace a prioritization system. You know, we always are going to have to recognize that, uh, you know, a regulatory agency such as EPA is going to have limited resources. We ought to be targeting those resources and focusing our greatest concern on those chemicals that have, you know, that, that are, are, are chemicals of concern, that might be those that are persistent, that are biocumulative. Uh, and that we ought to also then have a prioritization where you're going to require more information from my member companies when you have these high uh, chemicals of concern, which REACH doesn't uh, address uh, effectively. The Canadian system takes a much different approach where they have analyzed about 23,000 different chemicals. They have identified 4,000 or so that we ought to be focusing most of our attention on. When we're talking about modernizing Tosca, we think that's got to be one of the fundamental uh, components of it. You know, let's, you know, set up a system where we are providing more information and data out there. Let us identify those chemicals which we should be most concerned with in terms of the health risk. Uh, let's ensure that EPA has the resources and the ability to make a safety assessment of those chemicals that, we're, that are going into the marketplace. Because ultimately, you know, my manufacturers, my companies, want to ensure that Kaiser has the confidence in the products that they're using. And they're going to have the confidence uh, when they're assuring that the private sector is providing the right information and EPA and the regulatory process is doing the appropriate science-based science assessment of the safety of those products. Okay. Thank you. Could I briefly address that, Congressman? Yes. Also, um, I, I do. Uh, reach is a reality. It is. It is in place, and it changes the dynamic of many of the issues we're talking about as we look at Tosca reform. So, m most of the global, most of the chemical industry is global in nature, and many of the companies represented by the associations at this table do business in Europe. They are already going to have to comply with reach. They are going to have to develop the data that it requires. That makes the, our lift that much easier. L you know, we, we don't have to reinvent the wheel, and I totally ag agree with Mr. Dooley. We shouldn't be out there testing chemicals that have already been tested in Europe. But I, so I think reach, regardless of how good or bad a model people think it is, it changes the entire chemical global economy in a way that has to be recognized and has to be taken into account in terms of how we think about Tosca reform. The idea of getting to all of the chemicals in commerce, which REACH is trying to do, I think is fundamentally where we need to go. How fast we can get there and how we do it and how we prioritize that, those are all great areas for discussion, but we have to get to that point. Uh my friend, Mr. Stearns from Florida. Thank you, thank you Madam Chair. Um, Mr. DeLisi, um, is it unfair to say that since the World Trade Organization will make it very tough to ban articles in commerce, if we ban chemicals in the United States, the manufacturers of those chemicals in the United States will go somewhere else? But the products for which the chemicals was made will stand, will still wind up being sold in the United States, and if so, why? Well, basically, the United States consumer will look for the best value they can get, and uh, if you take a chemical out of commerce in the United States that produces a product that the consumer wants to buy, and they can uh, get the same finished product, the same finished article, from India, China, or Korea, or any place else. Uh, that material will find its way to the United States market, and the United States will have lost the ability to produce that product um, to the alternate that comes in. And the WTO would make it very difficult to ban the importation of that article as long as there was no exposure to that particular product. You want to add to that, Mr. Uh, Mr. Ernst, I, would, I would like to add one thing to that and, and maybe augment it a bit. That, And again, I think, you know, I think we're all sitting at the table in the first panel itself. I think we don't disagree on a lot. It's it's how it's how we get there, it, that's the important thing, and 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 do it the right way. But in in follow up to uh, to uh, Mr. Delisi's comment, if if you don't make the finished product, if you don't have the chemical here, you're not going to make the finished product here. 
And if you start going down the, the food chain, so to speak, if you're, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna have the building blocks made here either, i.e. my members, the petrochemical producers. So we, are, we, we will, if we don't do this right, uh, we will be seeding our t entire manufacturing base to foreign suppliers. So these are the ki kinds of things I think that, that, that uh, ranking, chair, ranking member Mr. Radonovich was, was speaking about, that whatever we do, uh, uh, let's do it right. We're not, from, the, from the industry side here, we're not sitting here saying, oh, don't do anything to Tosca, leave us alone, you've, you've, you've beaten us up over the last 30 years. No, we're not saying that at all. We, we all have the same objective, I hope, because if not, we shouldn't even be here. But, but let's make sure we do it right. So, so from Mr. Dennison's side of the table, and I don't want to put sides on this thing, that we get to where he and his, his, his group wants to go, but we still maintain a strong manufacturing base and, and employment in this country. And again, they're not mutually exclusive. Mr. DeLisi, if small and medium-sized companies, um, can they do the reach themselves? Almost impossible. The, uh, the setup under reach, uh, all the testing work has to be done in so-called uh, substance information exchange forums, many of which have more than four or 5,000 members. And so what's happening is that consortium are being formed to do some of the testing. And in many instances, this consortium are being controlled uh, by very large uh, European companies, and sometimes they're not allowing uh, U.S. and other producers uh, equal access to the data. It's going to be very, very difficult to figure out how small and medium-sized companies can survive uh, under REACH-like uh, requirements. Maybe we can talk about, I guess, REACH is just starting in Europe. Uh, can you tell me about the lab laboratory capacity in Europe? Maybe after REACH went into effect, has this allowed the European chemical manufacturers to innovate with better or safety, safer chemicals? or more carbon emission friendly efforts like alternative energy or green energy? What, what, what's, what's the status, the early status? Well, it's, it's been widely published that, that uh, most, if not all, the laboratory capacity in Europe is being diverted to uh, reach testing requirements. And in fact, a lot of the laboratory capacity all over the world is being diverted to that end use. And so it's not doing uh, other kinds of things that, that may or may not have uh, a, a better uh, result for, for, for our race. So you're saying basically they're not innovating and they're not necessarily providing safer chemicals? They're just, just complying with all the regulations? There's only a limited amount of resource to put into R&D activities and a lot of it right now is being diverted into REACH. So if that happened in the United States, do you expect the same thing to happen here that's happening in Europe? Undoubtedly. Mm -hmm. Uh, is your contention that the main difference between REACH and TSCA is not Section 6C requirements to consider other factors, but rather whether sound, high quality, and repeatable science underpins the regulation rather than unsubstantiated research or gaps in the data? Um, I'm Very con contorted question. The main difference between REACH and TSCA well, the main reason, the main difference between REACH and, and TOSCA is there is no grandfathering under REACH, and so it requires complete testing data sets to be done on, on everything that's going to continue to be in commerce, regardless of the inherent hazards or known uh, on the products. So it's, it's, it's requiring the redoing of an awful lot of effort that's reasonably well known by industry. Mr. Dresna, Dresna do you want to comment on that too? Well, it, you know, it, I would only, I only go to say again that, you know, and then I'll agree with Mr. Dennison, if it's already done, why duplicate it? Yeah. And to force that on every manufacturer in the United States will, will, be, will, will cause paralysis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my friend Ms. Sutton, representative from Ohio, and is next. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Schakowsky. Um, Mr. Dennison and, and all of you, I, I, it's been alluded to here today, um, and I think that most Americans would be shocked that asbestos is not currently banned. I, I think that they would, would, would be surprised to learn that. Uh, a week or so ago, we had a hearing 
um, in, in another area, but I'm noticing a pattern here. Um, and it dealt with the, the tainted peanut butter that ha has resulted in a salmonella outbreak across this country, killing people where I live. Um, and we learned then that, or, or we, I, I know because I knew it because we introduced a bill last year uh, to give the FDA mandatory recall authority, which people were likewise shocked to understand that our government didn't have the authority to recall things um, when they know that, that there is a problem, that it is voluntary, that we expect companies to just do what is in the best interest of, of, of the American public, and perhaps um, sometimes they're, they're, they live up to that more than others. Um, certainly some do, some obviously do not. Uh, and then you come and you tell us about the issue of formaldehyde in plywood. And I, I, I just have to get more information about this. Um, you made a, a, a reference to the United States becoming a dumping ground for unsafe products. And you used the example of the plywood coming in from China, plywood that does not even um, reach standards that allow it to be utilized in China or Japan or, or other parts of the world. But it's coming to the US. Okay? And I guess my first question is this. Um, it's coming to the U.S. because it's cheaper? Yes, that is the primary uh, reason. Those, those adhesives uh, reduce, are, are less expensive than the safer alternatives, and they reduce cost. And there are other reasons that have to do with why it's being made in China in the first place but that make it cheaper as well. But yeah, and I would love in, a, in another uh, venue to, to talk about those other reasons because, I, you know, I'm, I'm a person who thinks that, frankly, our, our, our international trading system mm -hmm. isn't, um, isn't living up to the promise that perhaps it could, but um, a, another day and another time. Um, okay, so it's coming in because of, of its, its cost, um, lower cost, it's being imported. I assume that it's been banned in, for use in these other countries because of data that exists that shows it's dangerous, correct? So we know it. Um, and what is the liability for a company that is choosing, because it's cheaper, to import this, which we know is toxic for the American people? Um, can you give us an idea about um, what potential consequence that company has when uh, you know, years from now, people suffer and die uh, because we're allowing it to come into the country. Well, I do think that um, the contrast between asbestos and an example like formaldehyde is an important one. Part of the reason that asbestos, despite the fact that it was not banned, is actually largely off the market. Right. It's creeping back in in a few places, but it's largely off the market. Is because of liability that the companies that made it and used it face. But that's a very special case because asbestos causes a signature disease that can be linked directly to asbestos exposure. Most chemicals are far more complex than that. And the ability to go to court and say, this chemical caused that person to get that disease is very limited. That's part of the new science that we have to incorporate into the way we think about chemicals. Because we can't wait until we can have absolute proof that chemical X is the sole cause of disease Y in order to regulate. Formaldehyde is in that case where we know it is linked to many different diseases. And in fact, actually there the evidence of its ability to cause cancer is, is established firmly. But I think we have to adapt our model of, and the way we think about chemicals and this burden of proof to reflect the reality of the science that we now know about chemical exposures and effects. Well, I appreciate that, and I'd love to follow up with you uh, after the hearing. Thank you. I'd be happy to. Now uh, our, a new member to this Congress and to this committee, Mr. Scalise. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Dooley, uh, I know we've had some testimony in, in other subcommittees 
uh, where the effects of energy regulation as, as a new energy policy is being considered, what effects that would have on, on various industries. And there were a few, uh, a few industry uh, members of your organization that had talked about uh, various problems they've had as, as energy costs went up, but also as some of these changes are being anticipated and what that meant to, uh, to jobs in the United States, and in some cases layoffs here, uh, in other cases, people making decisions to, to move operations overseas uh, so as not to be regulated uh, in an overly burdensome way. And, and, and I think as we, as we look at TSCA and, and, and revisit uh, the changes that might be made and we realize the importance of being cautious that we address problems without uh, being over-regulatory in a way that actually uh, creates jobs that are safe jobs in this country, uh, how, how is your industry looking at this and what uh, what, what things have you seen already or what, what concerns do you have about how that may impact jobs uh, for businesses that are playing by the rules, doing things right, but, uh, but concerned about over-regulation? I think, you know, just to, um, you know, what our industry is supportive of is a, a modernization of our chemical management system uh, that is done in a manner which enhances the public confidence uh, that consumers and users of our products have. Uh, that also ensures that we are enacting a system uh, that is science-based and is efficient uh, uh, and also embraces a risk-based approach. Um, and we think we can do that through this modernization that would accomplish a lot of the objectives that all parties that have testified today. But there are some areas which we think are, are critical in order to maintain uh, the investment in the U.S. in the development of these innovative and technological advances that are contributing to uh, the U.S. chemistry industry being at the leading edge of, you know, a lot of the energy efficiency uh, technologies that are being developed. And if I can just touch on a little bit of, uh, of, of where, we're, where we're at, which um, is again, which I've stated before, is that, you know, we are committed to providing the appropriate data. Um, you know, it, it, there needs to be some improvements in what we've seen in the past. We need, though, to ensure that we're prioritizing when we're providing all that data, unlike what REACH does, where you have this, you know, millions of these applications that are coming in, is that you need to be, you know, targeting those chemicals that should be the greatest concern. And then when you have those chemicals of the greatest concern, it might be formaldehyde, it might be asbestos, it might be something else, is it doesn't mean that those chemicals or, or products are going to be dangerous in all applications, because some applications might not have an exposure to humans. And so then you're going to have to have a system that will allow you to go down and to identify where those chemicals are at risk, those exposures, which we should be concerned with, so that we can also incorporate that data that can help us manage that. And the one thing that also brings into play is, is like REACH is taking more of what we refer to as a hazard-based approach. That if you have a chemical that is identified as a, a chemical of concern, is that you could ban it for all applications versus just those applications which result in an exposure uh, that could result in a problem. And, and that's the system that we think, if you put in place, will ensure that our industry can continue to be competitive internationally. Yeah, and, and I think, and, and I know we've got to vote, um, I think there are some, I think ethanol is, is an example where uh, used at a high level, it's very dangerous, but it, it's, it's actually very prevalent in, in a number of products that are used across the board uh, at a low level, and it, it causes no problems. So, so obviously the, uh, the dosage, the, the amount, is, uh, is something that's really got to be focused on. But. And, that, and that is a great example. Uh, we had uh, Ms. Swanson with the Learning Disabilities Association, which uh, talked about you know, some of their concerns with neurological impacts of various chemicals. Ethanol is, in fact, is a, a chemical that has uh, been demonstrated if used in, in excess to cause fetal alcohol, or fetal alcohol syndrome, uh, a neurological prob uh, disease, and, and something nobody wants to, you know, to see uh, occur. Uh, but ethanol is also a naturally occurring product in apple juice. If you took it to the extreme and took a hazard-based approach because ethanol created a neurological response, uh, you would end up then, again in the extreme, banning apple juice and a lot of other, you know, natural products which actually have no risk or pose no risk to, pe uh, to, to consumption. 
And so that's the challenge we face here is, you know, how do we put together a system where we provide the adequate information, we have the, uh, th those exposures which create a risk and a problem, uh, and, and ensure that we are providing yeah. that level of safety. And I think that's a concern, that we take a responsible approach that encompasses all of those variables. So I'll, I'll yield back. Thank you. Uh, Representative Castor of Florida. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'd like each of you on the panel to, uh, to just state very briefly whether or not you support, as part of the modernization of uh, TSCA, the shifting of the burden of proof to the chemical manufacturer rather than forcing EPA to assume complete responsibility for determining risk. Ms. Kasser, I, I, think, I think a lot of that is already being done. Uh, I, I, th there's been talk that, that, a, in a, a, that a reach like approach would take all the burden off the government and put all the burden on the, um, on, on the industry. The, the industry is more than willing to give, to give the, the appropriate data and to do what's right, but that is not going to relieve government, EPA, whatever authority you, you, you deem necessary to, to, to handle these myriad of laws, that, that, they, that they can't get get data from other sources, and they do. And that, I think that's where there's been either a miscommunication or a misunderstanding with, with how much data, <clears throat> excuse me, EPA has and what, they, what they've done with it. They've got, they've got tons of data. So is that a yes or a no? Oh, I'm sorry. It's, it, yes, we, 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 we think that, that, we, that the industry has and will step up more even so to the plate. And you'd support it if it, a statutory change. If, that. if it's done, if it's, if, as again, as I said before, if it gets to the end, the result, without, with, without burden, uh, extra burdens, without uh, making it non-competitive vis-a-vis uh, you know, international and, and keeping American the economy strong and growing, or hopefully we okay. get back to that. Uh, I, I agree basically with, with, with what's been said, and I think at the end of the day that burden is going to need to be shared. I would just echo that. It's, it, it's inevitably going to be a shared responsibility. Uh, our board at the American Chemistry Council, though, has adopted a position where EPA needs to be in a position of assessing the safety of the products that we put into the, to the marketplace. Uh, uh, so it will, you know, we are willing to accept a much greater responsibility than is currently required under statute, uh, but it will inevitably have to be a shared responsibility. And I think uh, where the burden of proof should not exist is at the end user level, which is the experience that I've been describing at Kaiser Permanente. So I think the discussion that others on the panel have been having about uh, perhaps a, a shared uh, collaborative approach would, would be a good one. I do think on a legal basis, the industry needs to have the burden of proof, but I absolutely agree. EPA needs to play an oversight role of that that's very careful. I do want to say I, there have been, with all due respect, a number of major inaccuracies stated about REACH. It does prioritize. It does not require the same data for all chemicals. It has some aspects that are driven by hazard, but it's fundamental framework is risk-based, not hazard-based, and it does consider uses of chemicals in deciding whether or not to restrict a particular use. Thank you. And I have one other question. I'd ask you to submit your, your answers for the record because I think it's going to be a more involved answer. Uh, I'd ask you all to, to explain that why, since the adoption of TSCA in 1976, only one group of chemicals have been, have been barred. And at that, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll yield back my time. Thank you. Um, at this point, let me ask unanimous consent to submit a number of documents, including those from Mr. Rodanovich um, and others, into the, the record. Um, Mr. Rodanovich has asked uh, to have one more question, and you may. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Mr. Dooley, welcome to the panel and back to Congress. Cal and I shared the district in California, big ag producing districts. And I've got a FIFRA question, but I want a real quick one since we're running out of time and going to vote. On the change o meter, if zero is no change to Tosca and 10 is, is change like the Consumer Product Safety Act, where would you be in the zero to 10 range? Uh, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's tough because that's always going to be relative. And if, uh, 
you know, I could say that 50%, uh, uh, but Mr. Dennison might think my 50% is only 25%. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, I would contend that Tosca is, is not broken, but is in dire need of modernization. And we think that it provides a good foundation to move forward. And, and, uh, and so I will go with a 50% change of meter. Real quickly, Mr. Dooley, uh, if uh, FIFRA, there's a lot of people that feel that the FIFRA, which deals with uh, pesticides, agriculture stuff, and that, that the rules of FIFRA ought to just be flipped into Tosca and, and that be done. Can you uh, state whether or not that would be a great idea or not? Well, we, we would uh, be very, very cautious about going down that path, uh, uh, again, because of the um, – it, it wouldn't, uh, in many cases, be effective in enhancing uh, the safety uh, and the public safety of our products. But I would say, again, that when you go through a process of prioritization and you do find a chemical that is of great concern, because it might be an endocrine disruptor, it might be a biocumulative, is that we're going to have to have a different standard in terms of the amount of data that the industry is going to have to provide uh, and the scientific research and assessment of those products. We don't contend it would be FIFRA uh, necessarily, but it will be a higher standard than what is currently being provided under TOSCA. All right. Thank you, Mr. Dooley. And uh, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. At this point, let me thank our uh, panel for their testimony. Appreciate it very much. And the meeting is, the hearing is adjourned. <laughs>